Thank you very much uh, to take uh, time and uh, really appreciate. And uh, yeah, uh, Internet Week is an event for uh, providing opportunities uh, mainly for uh, tech people who participate in uh, Internet infrastructure. Uh, this event organized by uh, JPNIC, Japan Network Information Center, a uh, membership-based non-profit organization for promoting internet with uh, 28 volunteers in program program committee. Uh, yes. JPNIC is an IP address registry in Japan and uh, also promote uh, internet uh, governance participation from Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, in Taiwan, a similar organization is uh, TWNIC, I think, and yes. uh, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah, JPNIC don't have a, a domain registry function, I but see. very similar organization. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And, uh, my name is uh, Masanori Tsunoki, nice to meet you. Uh, mm -hmm. I am a, a primarily a city company to drive mm -hmm. a digital transformation on the financial sector. And uh, I also uh, organize a tech community for uh, security management of uh, digital asset custodian and exchange. And uh, I also work as uh, executive advisor to the government CIO and uh, promote some uh, programs such as uh, special fixed benefits and uh, uh, exposure notification application. And uh, in Japan, uh, in uh, face of uh, COVID-19, many, many problems are happening and uh, we have to resolve it to uh, plan to make a new ministry, a digital ministry, a digital agency, not ministry. Yes. Uh -huh. and, uh, yeah. Now uh, we are planning many, many things and uh, also uh, I like to uh, learning from uh, broader success cases. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I, I, uh, I'm very uh, surprised that the uh, Taiwan success case. Uh, I hear that uh, uh, no new cases of uh, COVID-19 over 20, 200 days. 200 days, that's correct. Uh, and uh, Taiwan have been able to deal with uh, COVID-19 better than any other country in the world. What, and, uh, what is uh, role of uh, digital on this success case. Can, um, mm -hmm. can you tell me? Yeah. Yes, uh, the, we use the digital in three ways. It's mm -hmm. called fast, fair, and fun. Uh, the fast part is a collective intelligence system. Mm -hmm. Not only did we notice the Wuhan uh, situation thanks to the whistleblowing of Dr. Li Wenliang uh, mm -hmm. last December, uh, on a not-for-profit Reddit-like forum in Taiwan called PTT uh, that enable us to respond on the first day of January. So yeah. that's really quick. And people can call 192 to a hotline to get all their questions answered. And new ideas uh, can get amplified in the daily CECC, that's the Central Epidemic Command Center press conference which is live streamed over the digital channels such as YouTube and so on. So that's the fast part. The fair part concerns the distribution of masks because in the very beginning, masks uh, are uh, very um, required, but people don't have a lot of access to it because people uh, were uh, afraid that uh, if they don't stockpile enough mask at home, uh, they will run out of mask. So because of that, we started a mask rationing policy to mm -hmm. ensure the fair access to the mask. And the mm -hmm. pharmacists, uh, 6,000 of them, work with civic technologists on the availability map so people can see which pharmacy still have the mask. And later on, we included more than 12,000 uh, convenience stores and so on into the distribution so that by March, uh, we already have three quarter of people wearing the mask and washing their hands. And so by April, the R value becomes below one. Uh, and that's how we eliminated the virus. And finally, uh, the fun part is a very cute spoke stock. Uh, with the name Zong Chai, uh, is a Shiba Inu uh, that explained all the scientific <laughs> knowledge in very cute terms. Like when you're indoor, keep three Shiba Inu away from one another. 
if you're outdoor, keep two Shiba Inu away, otherwise wear a mask. So it's very easy to remember. And when people laugh about it, they don't get so anxious as to spread the disinformation. So we tackle not only the pandemic with no lockdown, we also fix the infodemic with no takedown. Mm. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very surprised. Shiba Inu is uh, popular in Taiwan? Very, very popular, yes. Uh, and even uh, myself participated in the public communication. For example, just uh, last week, I featured in a short film, just one minute long, and mm. I played the role of Doraemon. Uh, <laughs> and <laughs> it's also very popular in Taiwan. Mm. And uh, another question. And, uh, in Japan, uh, uh, mask distribution case is uh, broadly uh, promoted. And uh, uh, some politicians ask me uh, why Japan uh, cannot do that. Uh, but uh, I felt it's very difficult because of uh, uh, if uh, update uh, stock of mask uh, continuously, uh, all stores have to contribute to uh, push data. And not only that, uh, uh, if uh, distributed mask, uh, all ident identity is very important uh, to uh, limit to uh, I'm very surprised that uh, it's very difficult to uh, short term to prepare that not only a development uh, visualization system but also uh, uh, identify citizens and uh, update uh, stock of uh, masks uh, why do you uh, why you can uh, do that? Um, so first of all, it is because during the SARS uh, mm. 1.0 in 2003, uh, we already started the IC card of the national health insurance. It was at the time only tested in Penghu in the Pescador Island. But because mm. of SARS, we realized this IC card is really, really helpful. Um, and so it gets more popular. So after SARS, uh, everybody in Taiwan, not just Penghu, switched to the national uh, insurance card. And the insurance card covers not only citizens, but also 99.99% of residents, including but not limited to migrant workers and so on. And because of this, we made sure that anyone who show up at the pharmacies they can use their national health card to get a mask in exactly the same way as they would refill their chronic prescriptions. So we piggyback on a process that especially the elderly people are already familiar with. So there's two factor. One is the wide availability of IC card, uh, which as I understand, you also have the My Number card. Um, <laughs> and similar to our national health card, it can only be used for public service, not commercial service. But mm. the availability in Japan is probably not 99.9%. Yeah. So that's the first point. And the second point is the pharmacies already know how to process this uh, system because uh, almost all of them, I think close mm -hmm. to 90%, have a fiber optic line and VPN connectivity. And mm -hmm. even in the less connected places, they also have ADSL and so on, so that they can process the volume of data very easily. Mm. Thank you very much. And uh, I also surprised that uh, stock uh, sharing, stock information sharing, you use uh, blockchain or not? So we use distributed mm. ledger, but mm. we don't use blockchain. Oh. We use a distributed ledger that you're very familiar with probably, it's called Git. Uh, mm. And Git and GitHub and GitLab mm. and so on. These are also ledger technologies, but mm. they are not blockchain, right? Oh. In, in Git, if you make a commit, it hash your commit with your previous commit. And so it's, there is block, there is a chain. It's a ledger, but it's not <laughs> blockchain. Oh, <laughs> yes, thank you very much. In uh, Git, there is no consensus algorithm. The consensus uh, algorithm is uh, determined uh, just by the national open data portal. So the API that we publish every 30 seconds uh, is the source of truth. There is no multiple writer. 
there's just one single writer, the National Health Insurance Agency. So it's not strictly speaking a blockchain, but it's <laughs> replicated to more than 140 applications and they serve as the nodes for uh, replication. It's been uh, replicated, I think, more than uh, uh, maybe 10, yeah, it's been replicated more than 10 million times from the master branch of the central uh, API server. Uh, so I would say it's distributed, it's a ledger, but it is not a blockchain. Ah, thank you very much. And uh, uh, in Japan, we also discuss about uh, how to utilize DLT on a government application, but mm -hmm. many, many problems we found. Uh, one is uh, it's very fragmented, mm -hmm. and uh, update uh, is very uh, frequently, and uh, not enough uh, engineers they mm -hmm. can programming uh, smart contract on uh, DLT. And why? Uh, well, if you are talking about commit hook, which is mm -hmm. a kind of smart contract on mm -hmm. Git, then mm -hmm. there are many engineers that can program it. So oh, yeah. my suggestion is don't limit yourself to mm -hmm. Bitcoin, Ethereum, or mm -hmm. any of those cryptocurrency oriented DLTs. There could be many DLTs whose primary application is not cryptocurrency, yeah. uh, in which case many programmers know what Git uh, means and how to yeah. program yeah. it. Yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, we found such kind of a uh, uh, mask case on uh, April or May, but uh, I very surprised, still very good condition in Taiwan. and. Uh, can I ask uh, what kind of uh, role on uh, digital technology on uh, past uh, half years on uh, managing this situation? Yeah, uh, I think the quarantine is the most important part. So mm -hmm. once we have more than three quarter of people wearing masks and washing hands, uh, yeah. Well, more than 90% now, but uh, anyway, we control the R value. So the important thing is how to prevent the second yeah. or the third wave coming from abroad, right? So we make sure that they either go to a quarantine hotel and yeah. stay there for 14 days where yeah. they're physically prevented from leaving, or yeah. if they live in a flat with their yeah. own bathroom, they can also choose home quarantine, in which case, their phone or we give them a phone if they don't have a phone for two weeks is put into this automated SMS system. If the mm. phone leaves uh, through cell phone tower signal strength triangulation, the 50 meter or so radius of their quarantine area, then the SMS is sent not only to them, but also to the local health officers. And mm. so uh, we make sure that if you stay for 14 days, we pay you every day about 30 US dollars as a stipend. But if you break the quarantine and get detected by the digital fence, then we mm. fine you up to 1,000 times that. So you can fund a thousand more people, I guess. So nobody break the quarantine. And mm. that is why it stays safe to this day. Mm. Uh, such kinds of applications, we, uh, if we uh, try to deploy Japan, uh, some people may uh, concern about the privacy. Mm -hmm. uh, what is a good balance of uh, privacy and uh, social benefit, do you think? Yeah, we do not collect any data mm. that are not already collected before mm. the pandemic. Mm. So no new data collection. It's uh -oh. very important. Mm. The telecom already know where your phone is. Mm. Otherwise, they cannot provide roaming service. Mm. The telecom already sent automated SMS. Otherwise, mm. we cannot advancely warn people of earthquake or flood mm. warnings. So mm. these data collection are already there. And the mm. data operators are the same people. They're the mm. same five telecoms. They're mm. not sending the data to some commercial processor. And so all we did is essentially saying what people already received for earthquake and typhoon flood warnings mm. uh, or forest fire or whatever, we use it to make the digital quarantine work. Of course, we sacrifice some precision because it's not very precise. We do not know which room they are in, uh, unlike 
GPS, Bluetooth, Beacon, or some other technology, but people mm -hmm. feel comfortable because they know that this is not an app. They don't have to install anything. By the time that the two week is over, um, there's mm -hmm. no way for an SMS sending application on the cell phone tower to read mm -hmm. their email or something like that. So by collecting no new data, the privacy constraint is very easily explained. Mm. Thank you very much. It's very clear. And, uh, uh, no other question. Uh, in Japan, uh, many, many social sectors provide uh, voluntary work for uh, anti-COVID issues. Yes. And uh, may, some problems uh, happen. For example, uh, multiple groups want to do the uh, same uh, function. Oh, yeah, yes. Uh -huh. And the uh, government cannot choose uh, by uh, logically, but uh, yeah. Uh, they cannot uh, make a new contract earlier, and uh, mm, we don't have any process that uh, uh, rapid to uh, rapid uh, engagement with the social sector. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I like to know uh, uh, my understanding that uh, Taiwan has a reverse procurement process. Yes. Uh, where they built the application, we supply the data and give them a domain name. Hmm. Uh, but Tokyo Metropolitan Government did the same with yeah. Code for Japan on the dashboard. Hmm. Yeah, Mr. Seki is a very famous mm -hmm. uh, open government guy, and he also joining the government on this yes. month. And uh, yeah, it is a very impressive case. And uh, hmm. Yeah, local government is faster than uh, national government in some cases. And uh, another aspect, uh, we worry about uh, education and uh, COVID-19. And uh, uh, currently, uh, some universities are still suspended. And uh, high school and the junior high school and the elementary school are already uh, started, but uh, if uh, COVID will come back, uh, it will, it may, uh, uh, will suspend it. And uh, can I ask uh, what situation in Taiwan still uh, back to normal, uh, already back to normal? Yeah, it's been uh, normal for many months now uh, because we never had a lockdown uh, at any point. Uh, mm. It's true that we delayed the semester for schools for two weeks but it's mm. not because of a local transmission, it's because we need to get a mask and uh, alcohol hand spray available. Once mm. we made sure that everything is available oh, and the thermal meter also important, uh, then we opened the schools and we never shut down uh, any schools. Um, and so in Taiwan, I think the main idea is that we need to stop the virus at the border. If we stop it at the border, then even if it mutates, even if there's SARS 2.1, 2.2, beta, service pack, <laughs> SARS 3.0, mm. uh, it's uh, going to be respiratory disease, right? It's not going to become a different kind of virus. It's just going to be more virulent. Uh, and so we can still stop it with the physical vaccine, which <laughs> is the mask and the same uh, border quarantine controls. Mm. Thank you very much. And, uh, mm. Situation is very different, and uh, another education-related question. In Japan, uh, on this year, uh, we uh, started uh, programming education and uh, uh, distribute uh, PC for all uh, children, and uh, yeah, it is a great opportunity we can provide that, but uh, still very difficult to uh, teaching, uh, learning uh, teaching method of uh, programming and uh, any other. Uh, can I ask uh, what is uh, important to, uh, for educating that uh, adapt, adapt to uh, digitalization? Uh, I think it's important to mm. show that the education is for digital competence, 
is mm. not for digital literacy. Mm. Because if you use the term literacy, it sounds like media literacy. And mm. media literacy is a, a very like last century idea when mm. few people uh, make radio and television channels and many people only watch or listen to the channels and they need to be literate. However, mm. uh, nowadays everybody can use their phone and become a broadcaster and mm. become a essentially a news worker. Mm. Uh, and they're competent in producing data, producing the narrative, producing the media. And so the education should be treating them as producers instead of consumers of data. Actually, the term consumer of data doesn't mean anything, right? <laughs> so uh, if you say digital literacy, it's uh, the wrong terminology to use, uh, in my humble opinion. And so uh, yeah. the main idea is that people learn by curating data. They can measure the air quality, water quality. They can fact check their presidential candidates. Any way to participate in something of public benefit is a good way to teach about data stewardship, about GDPR requirements, about data portability, accountability, value alignment. These things are impossible to teach, but they can learn if you are a data producer. So start producing data as early as possible. I uh, completely agree. And, uh, but uh, it's very difficult because uh, my understanding is that uh, it's not for children, but also uh, adult people also uh, get uh, such kinds of uh, digital competence. Many, many uh, fake news uh, manipulated by uh, not children, but adult. And, uh, Sometimes uh, commercial media also uh, they cannot uh, uh, choose. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the elderly people they have a lot of wisdom to share, mm. but sometimes because they are very young people in terms of cyberspace. Mm. So, like any uh, uh, young child, uh, mm. if someone they know tell them something, they just <laughs> trust that without bothering to check. So, in that sense the elderly people are like children because they are new to cyberspace. And so I think the same idea that we teach children to fact check so that they can produce media that are more balanced and so on also mm. works for the elderly, but with the only caveat that, that it need to be something that they care about. So mm. maybe the elderly people care about sustainability, about environment more. They care more about the public welfare of the next generation instead of their own generation and so on. And so in these cases, we make sure there are what we call intergenerational solidarity, where people who are maybe 16 or 17 years old is paired mm -hmm. with people who are 60 or 70 years old, and they form a team uh, and mm -hmm. uh, they can create the narrative together by interviewing each other and things like that. And we found that this works really well, maybe because both generation, both age groups have the most free time on their hands. <laughs> if you are 17 or 70, uh, you have a lot of free time, but not the people in between. Yeah, very interesting. Uh Oh, in Taiwan, such kinds of a program already deployed? Already exists, yes. Uh, and uh, we make sure that we call it Qing Ying Gong Chuang, co creation between the mm. young and the silver haired. Mm. Very interesting. Uh, sometimes uh, some schools uh, don't, uh, don't permit uh, take a uh, smartphone to school, but uh, I think it's not a good idea because uh, it's, uh, uh, mm, the children cannot uh, get the experience to use that. Uh, on the other hand, uh, in a school, uh, teachers can manage uh, lists for children because of uh, it is uh, physically separated from uh, external world. But uh, it's very difficult to uh, estimate risks to using digital technology by children. Uh, do you have any 
idea who are mm -hmm. yes. a, a trade off. Yeah. Uh, always in my lectures, uh, mm -hmm. I start by saying, get your phone out and mm -hmm. scan the QR code on Slido and start mm -hmm. asking me questions on Slido.com. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. And so by doing this, I essentially made everyone's mobile phone a part mm -hmm. of the classroom. Mm -hmm. And on Slido, you can still write something. You can still like each mm -hmm. other's questions. But mm -hmm. whatever you do, it will be a social object, meaning that it will be projected for everyone to see. And so mm -hmm. the attention is then still in the room. It's mm -hmm. not outside of the room. And when you say that the students uh, are in distance, that's fine too, right? Even if they are in their own home, as long as their phone is on asking me questions and liking each other's questions, they will mm. not get distracted by other media on their phone. So I think the main uh, question is that how digitally competent are mm. the teachers to children's phone part of the classroom? If you mm. can do it, then it's a net plus for your education because everybody learn in different speed. However, if you cannot do it, then the phone become a distraction, as you said. Mm. Thank you very much. Uh, I often use a slide uh, too, but uh, yeah, not only it as a tool, but also uh, teaching equipment, very interesting. Mm -hmm. And uh, in Japan, uh, uh, remote education are not permitted for uh, many, many universities mm -hmm. by regulation, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, in COVID-19, uh, they permitted it, but uh, now uh, situation is better and uh, huge uh, discussion, uh, remote or not. Uh, but uh, I think uh, we can uh, uh, use both. Uh, yeah, you can do 50%, 50%, yeah. Yeah, and uh, scaling, uh, remote education is very good for scaling, but uh, it's not all. Uh, I think face-to-face uh, -face, uh, lecture is also very important to continue uh, uh, interact and uh, mobilize and uh, many, many cases. Uh, yeah, thank you for me. And uh, sorry, I'd like to talk about the uh, future. Uh, we are, uh, it is, uh, I think, uh, COVID is a very uh, historical event. After that, uh, what we change and uh, how we have to change uh, current uh, world or uh, do you have any yeah, vision to the future mm -hmm. uh, after COVID world? Yeah, I think the COVID has really broken the boundary of the uh, so, like the sovereign nation each taking care of their own problems, like the multilateral model. Uh, it is really challenged by COVID because the virus doesn't need a passport. The virus <laughs> knows no boundaries and we <laughs> already now yeah. have the capacity to work across jurisdictional boundaries uh, like the Tokyo dashboard. I also contributed yeah. our mask map, uh, the Korean people also used <laughs> and so on. And before you need diplomats signing MOU or treaties yeah. <laughs> for this kind of thing to happen. But because COVID is everybody's business, so everybody across sector and across nations are willing to help. And so I think, first of all, this will enhance the multilateral model with a truly open multi-stakeholder model, which mm. is the foundation of internet governance. Because mm. the internet doesn't have a navy or a army, right? <laughs> all we have is radical transparency and mm. participation. Uh, and these ideas are amplified during the COVID because people see multilateral models doesn't work without the open stake, uh, multi-stakeholderism uh, as advocated by the NIC and by the ICANN, IETF and so on. Uh, and so this will be a permanent, I think, culture added to multilateral uh, situations. Mm. 
And so second, it will empower the ordinary people, or every citizen, to mm -hmm. start working on truly global problem because we already have the global solidarity on COVID. We can work on empowering the social sector to work on countering disinformation, to work on climate change, uh, to work on, I don't know, um, colonizing Mars, uh, anything that require a truly global effort. Uh, we are much more empowered to do it after COVID. Mm. Uh, I really feel such kinds of uh, empowerment for uh, people's interest broader and uh, uh, breaking many, many barriers, but uh, still, uh, society has uh, many, many aspects. Uh, for example, uh, digital government. Uh, of course, we have built new applications and uh, uh, take uh, good uh, practice from uh, other countries. And uh, on the other hand, uh, we still have many, many legacy applications and uh, very strict rules. Uh, how to uh, change, uh, how to uh, coordinate or how to uh, changing a legacy world by uh, such kind of uh, change. Uh, I, uh, back to uh, uh, reverse procurement cases, uh, we, I think uh, if uh, adopt a reverse procurement method, you have to change rules in government. Yes. Uh, what is a good process or how to uh, changing a legacy world by yeah. new technology? Yes. Uh -huh. I mm. think uh, one of the main ideas in mm. procurement is mm. to make sure that people build in an API first fashion. Mm. If you do not have a API first fashion, when the APIs are second uh, kind of um, classes that gets bolted on after mm -hmm. you build the system, then the API tend to be fragile because the system are tightly coupled and doesn't use the API anyway. Uh, yeah. The core insight of internet mm -hmm is that it's just a set of API. And mm. whenever a new API gets invented, people mm. don't need to ask the intermediaries. It's called end-to-end mm. -end innovation. But end-to-end -end innovation or permissionless innovation in the early internet is only possible because people designed the protocols to be liberal in what they accept. And so reflect that idea the uh, John Postel's law uh, mm -hmm. in the procurement uh, is important in Taiwan. Uh, we say not only you uh, procure a website, you mm -hmm. must do so just for people with blindness who cannot see as mm -hmm. well as for people who can see. And mm -hmm. if a vendor says, no, I'm not liberal in what we accept, only people with eyesight can use my website. People mm -hmm. who are blind uh, cannot. Uh, then they are discriminatory. They could be disqualified. They will be disqualified by our procurement rules for not providing universal access to people mm -hmm. with uh, seeing difficulties. And now we changed the procurement rule four years ago saying, if you only produce a digital service for mm -hmm. humans, but mm -hmm. if you do not provide a open API standard, a OAS machine to machine endpoint, then mm -hmm. you also get disqualified because mm -hmm. you discriminate against robot. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> we don't quite say discriminate against robot, but it's the, mm -hmm. the idea. So everybody now uh, know that for each and every new system for interactive use by human beings, they have to design with the API first in mind. Uh, mm -hmm. And many of the open data has been converted to the real-time open API according to the Linux Foundation standard, the mm -hmm. OAS3. And once you do that, reverse procurement becomes very easy because mm -hmm. you do not need to change the back-end systems. Mm -hmm. They can still run on legacy software, but because they are API first, if people want to build a chatbot or a VR experience or a uh, mobile phone experience, why not just go ahead and do it? These are the APIs already tested for cybersecurity. Mm. 
Thank you very much. Uh, Japanese government also provide the API past uh, three or four years and uh, many, many applications uh, uh, um, already available. And uh, uh, thank you very much for taking uh, time. And the last, my last question is, uh, uh, can I, uh, would you, uh, you still have uh, many, many dialogue with uh, Japanese people. And uh, in, do you have any uh, advice or recommendation for uh, Japanese digitalization? Yeah, I think our philosophy is very, very similar. Uh, I often mention that in Industry 4.0, IT is about connecting machine to machine. Mm -hmm. But in Society 5.0, which is more advanced than Industry 4.0, mm -hmm. digitalization mm -hmm. is about connecting people to people. Uh, and there is a RFC that says it's best. It says the internet is for its end users. Uh, and then I will add to that saying, even if the end users have not yet been born, if mm. the end users have not yet connected, the mm. future of the end users are not just end users, but co-creators of the internet. And so mm. if we design our digital services to connect people to the people and mm. also connect people today with mm. people in the future, then mm. we are on the right path. If mm. we are about only connecting machine to machine and mm. doing efficiency for current generation, but potentially sacrificing future generation, then we are on the wrong path. But I firmly believe Japan and Taiwan are the same value when it comes to inclusion and sustainability. Mm. Uh, thank you very much. I think so. Uh, I visited Taiwan two times and uh, yeah, very, very similar uh, situation and uh, very good. Yeah. Mm -hmm culture and the food and uh, yes. I like to uh, continue uh, and learning from Taiwan continuously. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Arigatou gozaimashita. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.